This is Mara and Ben for Stellar Strategy Gaming, and today we're going to be talking about elves and what we hope to see for elves in 6th edition. First, we're going to go over a little bit about what we have and what problems we have with 5e. Yes, now this, I believe, will immediately highlight one of the main problems, which is that the current types of official elf are High Elf, Wood Elf, Drow, Shadar Kai, Sea Elf, Eladrin, and... That is just off the top of my head. I'm actually fairly certain there are more of them, which I'm currently forgetting about, and two new books have actually released that I do not currently own, so that could be a lot more. And there are also four subtypes of Eladrin, which adds more onto that. <laughs> and part of the problem here with the way the elves are set up is that with, the, for example, the Dark Elf, the Drow, they have a whole different suite of abilities than, for example, the Wood Elf. I'm not going to get into exhaustive detail about that. It's simple enough to look up. Elves are overpowered to begin with, so having additional abilities for sub-races just makes something that's already overpowered even more overpowered. Elves as a race get the Dexterity boost. They age to... Uh, up to 750 years old, which can be a big deal depending on the type of campaign you're in. They have dark vision, they have proficiency and perception, and they have the fey ancestry, which gives them advantage against being charmed and can't put, be put to sleep by magic. They also have the trance ability, which means they don't need to sleep, and they only rest for four hours a day. So that's a pretty good suite of abilities. That would be, a, I would say, at least comparable to what, say, halflings have, and then they get their sub-race abilities on top of that. To Mara's point about the number of elves, I should point out that listed in just the player's handbook, there are ten types of dragonborn, but the way wizards set it up is that the dragonborn, they have a resistance and they have a breath weapon, and, which is determined by their color, so it's a simple, easy-to-remember table, and it's also customizable. So if you wanted to have a salt dragonborn, you could make that ability and resistance customized to your character. Uh, yes, and on top of all of this, I also just feel like this is the sheer number of them. It feels a bit like a cop-out, you know? With, with the dragons, that's not true, because with dragonborn... They have a correlation to a dragon type, and every dragon type has like two pages of lore. With the elves, every outer plane has a species of elf on it in some way, shape, or form, I guarantee it, with the exception of the Nine Hells in the current edition, to my knowledge. Again, there are two books which I don't own, so there might be elves for those already. But, oh, well, we don't have a plane for the astral, or we don't have species for the astral plane, and we're too lazy to develop it. I know, let's just stick an elf on it. Oh, well, the, the plane of water needs some inhabitants. And we already did water weirds for some reason. I know, let's make sea elves a thing. See what I'm getting at here? Yes. And it's, it's especially odd because, for example, goblins live short lives and are very numerous. But we only really have one type of goblin as a playable race. We really actually only have one type of goblin as a monster. There are things like hobgoblins and bugbears that count as separate species, but those are treated as entirely different entities, which is what I think Eladrin and probably sea elves should be. I don't have a problem with wizards acknowledging the relationship between the two as they acknowledge the relationship between, for example, stout havelings and dwarves, but having it be such a broad spectrum of things that all count as elf creates a lot of extra work for the DM, and it, it just makes the whole situation a lot more confusing. Yes, in fact, I'd actually like to go into that just a little bit more with a great example, which is that the Native American language, or uh, the most common form of it, is actually closely related in many ways to the uh, language which broke out in eastern Siberia. Now, if you're wondering where I'm getting at with this, a Native American person could not speak with a Eastern Siberian person. They would not be able to understand each other, and they would have such different cultural ideals as to the fact that even if some words are the same, they'd mean something completely different by that point. Now, elves don't just live on different continents. They live on entirely different planes. This means that even the language of elvish would be broken into massive dialects, and on top of all of this, they would also probably have even more traits that we that aren't really discussed uh, b between their different cultures and things like that. And so not only is it just a, well, 
but there are many of them, so there should be they should be broken up. It's a they would literally be completely different from each other. I completely agree with that. And actually, in the treatment of humans in the player's handbook, they list several different subtypes of humans and the different appearances of those subtypes of humans without giving stat variations on them. So this isn't something where we have to reinvent the wheel. The player's handbook did this right twice in two different ways. You can have human variants with the same stat block because tomorrow's example the many indigenous peoples of america are all physically you know human as are the peoples of siberia who they're related to you don't need to create a totally different uh, set of abilities for each kind of person regardless of how many types of them there might be and both in all fairness to wizards and furthering my point uh, the player's handbook actually does do this with elves too, in that high elves have two sub-variants, which are moon and sun elves, which means that there are actually more types of elves. <laughs> um, but while this is also a problem, uh, it's not quite as bad because they don't get broken up into separate abilities, they just, they basically have very slightly different skin color and they live in different locations, I believe. Uh, think Legolas versus uh, versus Elrond's people. You know, they're very different, but still very, but still related. So, and the elves. I'm going to go back a little bit into my problem with the elves being overpowered. This is well expressed with the Drow. The Drow, in addition to the ability score increase, they get superior dark vision. They have Drow magic that gives them the dancing lights cantrip. Fairy Fire at 3rd level, and 5th level they can cast Darkness. Now, Drow do have Sunlight Sensitivity, which means they take disadvantage in direct sunlight. Their other abilities largely counteract it. Fairy Fire not only helps the Drow, but it helps the entire party. And the Darkness spell creates a double-blind effect where the opponent would have disadvantage as well if they were fighting within the, the area of Darkness. This actually lends itself to a bigger problem, which I would like to see Wizards address in 6e. If you have a party of halflings going against a party of dragonborn, especially at lower levels, the dragonborn win just about every time. As a matter of fact, the dragonborn's breath weapons, if just if every member of that dragonborn party uses their breath weapon, that might do it. Half orcs might stand a shot because of their relentless endurance ability. Tieflings might stand a chance because of their a hellish resistance, at least if any of the dragonborns are red or gold, or I believe it's brass, all use fire damage. My point here is not to hate on halflings. One of my favorite characters I've ever played is a halfling ranger. He, but that is the worst race playing the worst class. And that character would not be a lot of fun to play in a party that had, let's say, a tiefling warlock, a half orc barbarian, and some other optimized characters. So what I think wizards should do, <clears throat> apart from simplifying elves, is I think they ought to break it in the races into tiers. So you might have tier one would be things like base humans and halflings. Tier two could be things like tieflings and dragonborn. And then at tier three, you would have something like an Aladrin, which is just a really OP over the top kind of uh, overpowered character. Uh, yes, and that actually brings me to the next thing, which is also that, by comparison to every other uh, race, they are the most able to spec into any class, and it and it's compounded by their lifespan. Uh, but I would I would go so far as to argue that were it not for this, dwarves would probably be on the same tier as elves. They're very strong overall, and while they do have slightly lower movement speed, their abilities are so over overpowered by comparison that it just outshines it. The issue comes with the fact that dwarves can only play what is effectively a fighter, a cleric, or a um, ranger, I believe, well, because of their wisdom or strength or... Uh, yeah, it's largely those two modifiers that get all the good stuff. Whereas elf... You have a subclass which gives... Well, they get a base dexterity boost. Then there is a subclass which gives you constitution. A, a subclass which gives you free spells. A subclass... 
And I could go on and on and on, and I'm not even getting into the fact that the Eladrin and Shadar Kai have teleport abilities, which all have unique sub-variants and things like that. So if you want to play any class in the book, why not just play an elf who's like 700 years old and has mastered everything, you know? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. <clears throat> if you're playing a high elf, among the proficiencies you get, uh, or among the abilities you get, is one cantrip from the wizard spell list, which means you can have an, an elf fighter who gets a cantrip that gives massive boosts or massive deficits to an opponent's fighting ability, because the wizard cantrip list is awesome. So you've got a fighter with this just almost insurmountable advantage to, say, a human fighter. If you're playing a wood elf, they their elf weapon training gives them proficiency with the longbow. So they're getting an ability that, that could uh, really contribute to the abilities of a monk or a rogue. You're, you're basically taking away the need to multi-class in order to get a lot of these abilities. So as stated, it's just, it's just kind of game-breaking how much they overdid this class. Uh, yes. Now, that is basically all we really had for the day. So I will say that uh, we hope you liked this video. Uh, if you did, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe if, if you want to see more. Uh, be sure to click that bell icon as well, just because it won't show you new videos if you don't now for some reason. And next week we'll be talking about tieflings.